Good evening, and welcome to the first virtual Founders Day celebration. I am Kim Brunischultz, president of U Alumni. To celebrate the founding of the University of Utah in 1850, we annually recognize alumni and honorary alumni who have served their community, excelled professionally, and supported the university in its mission. These annual Distinguished and Honorary Alumni Awards, along with honorary degrees, are among the highest honors awarded by the University of Utah. While this event looks a little different this year, we are still very excited to honor a wonderful group of university alumni, supporters, and our friends. I want to offer my personal thanks to Johnette Mangum and the U Alumni Recognition and Giving Committee for their work to select this year's outstanding recipients. It is my honor now to introduce the 16th president of the University of Utah, Ruth Watkins. President Watkins has been a strong supporter of U alumni, tirelessly attending a variety of events, meeting with our clubs, board of governors, and staff on a regular basis. We deeply appreciate her leadership as well as her friendship and will miss her involvement with all things alumni. Ladies and gentlemen, President Ruth Watkins. Every year as part of our Founders Day celebration, our Office of Alumni Relations provides us with an opportunity to recognize incredible alumni who are leading in their fields and in our community. This is one of my favorite events of the year as I get to learn about or be reminded of the amazing people who have attended the University of Utah and then gone on to do great things. Through their accomplishments, they bring great honor to this institution. Our congratulations to the 2021 Distinguished Alumni Award recipients, Rebecca chavez Hauk, Ronald Coleman, Sydney Dixon, Sarah Jones, Joan and Harold Wolf, and to our Honorary Alumni Award recipient, Ann osborne Pullman. You are going to learn more about each recipient in a few moments, but let me share a few thoughts about what they have in common. Each of our recipients reflects the values and principles that have been part of the U since its founding. Inquiry, innovation, public service, hard work, and the performing of good works in our community. Our 2021 honorees cross a range of fields and public roles. Governmental service, education, equity, diversity and inclusion, healthcare, student support, and mentoring. By example, they show what is possible when we ask ourselves, what good can I do in the world? How can I lead by example? How can I make a difference? We talk about being the university for Utah. Each of our recipients have met that call. They have seen a need, a possibility, an opportunity, and then stepped forward to action. They have not been afraid to take on some of the greatest challenges in our society. They have shown us what individual commitment makes possible and also what happens when we join together for the good of our communities. They have been passionate about bringing along the next generation of leaders. To our honorees, thank you for being an inspiration and a role model for all of us. You have exemplified the highest ambitions for the University of Utah set at its founding in 1850. On behalf of the University of Utah and our Alumni Association, Warmest congratulations to each of you. We are fortunate to have you as shining examples of the excellent education we provide and of how the experiences we provide our students prepare them to lead for career success and also for being change agents in our community. Now I invite you to learn more about each honoree in the videos that follow. Few people have traveled as far, had such interesting life twists, and accomplished as much as Sarah Jones. I was actually adopted from South Korea when I was three years old. My childhood in Utah was really wonderful. Um, I had wonderful adoptive parents, friends, schooling, but I really became very used to having people see me as unusual or different. And I think this actually helped me be really comfortable with doing things a little bit differently. I was lucky enough in high school and all through my schooling to have these teachers who always saw my potential and they would always encourage me to do math, science, honors classes. And I ended up coming to the University of Utah and participating in the Access Women in Science 
and math program. I spent time with 24 other women who were also getting STEM degrees, right? And it really opened my eyes to all of these different careers. Sarah graduated with honors from the College of Engineering with a BS degree in 1998 in chemical engineering. Next came law school at Brigham Young University, which led to a career as a patent attorney for Workman Nidegger. After having practiced law for 10 years, I actually got to this point where I needed to learn new things. But I also got to fail and try and try again, and that really started me on this path of just absorbing as many new skills as possible. This engineer turned lawyer set her sights on helping companies that focused on diversity and inclusion in the workplace and the value that brings the business. She was especially passionate about women in tech. So Women Tech Council was a really cool opportunity to bring together thousands of women and men together from our industry and say, let's do it differently. Let's start to build programs that take girls from the classroom all the way to the boardroom. Sarah's life was filled with success and recognition, but she still wanted to understand more about herself and her roots. I've always been an overachiever. And it wasn't until I kind of processed a lot of things around my adoption that I realized that that drive was actually connected to some trauma that I had experienced. When you're adopted, there's this really strong desire to um, be accepted. For me, I just really channeled all of that energy into success and achievements. Reconnecting with birth parents in South Korea is nearly impossible. However, Sarah arrived to the United States with a tattoo on her left arm, which her adoptive parents promptly removed. Years later, she retraced the tattoo with a marker and posted a photo on social media. A few months later, she had her answers. Due to extenuating circumstances, her birth father had to give up Sarah and her two brothers when they were young. Knowing it would be difficult to ever find them again, he gave each child the same tattoo. Though Sarah's birth father died before he could reconnect with her, the tattoo photo was immediately recognized by a family friend, and Sarah reunited with her brothers and family. The cross actually is a Christian cross, I found out. And the four dots actually were my family members. You know, for me, it really solidified my father's desire that if circumstances had been different, he would have kept us. Sarah is a powerful example of when you are bold and are proud of what makes you different. It has been her mission to convince others to celebrate what makes them unique and to use it to find success. To young women who are coming into you know, programs where they might feel a little bit different, different is good. My perspectives are different. The way I look at solutions are different. And the key for me has been to find those environments where that difference is appreciated. And when you find those environments, when you find that community that's gonna lift you up, then it allows you to have this freedom to share the great perspectives that you have based on your own life experiences. A love for public service, social justice, and developing meaningful public policy was instilled in Representative Rebecca chavez Hauk from a young age in what was then the small farming community of Riverton, Utah. The people that modeled that for me first and foremost were my parents. My father was a Mexican immigrant from Michoacan, Mexico. My mother was born here in the States, but her parents were from Mexico. Her parents paved the way as they served in grassroots organizations that advocated on behalf of the Latino and Mexican-American communities. Her political fire was further stoked along the way through education and special opportunities she earned. So here I was, this little farm girl from Riverton, Utah, and I went to Bingham High School, and I had the wonderful opportunity afforded to me by the local um, American Legion Auxiliary Group to go to Girls State in 1978, where I learned more about the electoral process, about governance. Rebecca's voice gained confidence and power as she did something no one in her family had ever done before. She became a student here at the University of Utah. My last year that I graduated, I actually ran for the Student Senate. Served in the Student Senate representing the College of Humanities. 
Uh, so a lot of this is just so interesting how things build up on each other. She completed her Bachelor of Arts degree in journalism and mass communication in 1982. Her first assignment was as a reporter in Evanston, Wyoming. But in her reporting, her eyes were open to how people were represented and something sparked in her. Really got to see what was happening in that community and how people that work in public service were, were helping those individuals and kind of reporting on all of that. When I came back to Salt Lake City, um, I began working for the Utah Public Employees Association. Uh, putting together the member newsletter. And so I was meeting the members, again, meeting people that were in public service. Over time, I'm looking at who's serving in office and great people that I'm not seeing a lot of people who look like me or who have my perspective or who have that shared life experience of being a little Mexican-American girl from the rich in Utah. Rebecca worked for 20 years as a public affairs staffer for a number of local Utah nonprofits before returning to the University of Utah, where she received her Executive Master of Public Administration degree in 2006. She then served in the Utah State House of Representatives as a member of the minority party. Often, her policy ideas faced a real uphill battle on Utah's Capitol Hill, nothing she couldn't handle. It's hard being a super minority in Utah, but heck, I'm a Latina woman that's lived in Utah my whole life. In some ways, there's a benefit to it. When I get something passed, it has been forged in the fires because you have to be able to defend it every which way. Representative Chavez Hauk served in the state legislature until 2018, where her impact was felt throughout diverse communities and across the state. You learn a lot about being nimble, about negotiating, about accommodating different perspectives. And any time that I've had the opportunity to talk to students, it's like we are all presented with opportunities and we can either take them or we can walk away from them. Fortunately, this girl from Riverton never walked away from opportunities and Utah is better for it. You guys are young. I'm 70. Oh. So edit that out. I, I don't know. I have no profanity. My wife is. Can you do that? Ronald G. Coleman came rushing into the world in 1944 in San Francisco, California. After graduating high school, he caught the attention of Utah football coaches Chuck Chatfield and Ray Nagel. They came to my parents' house in late December of 1962, and uh, they were interested in me uh, attending the University of Utah. I'm the oldest of six children, and Thomas Coleman used to always say, get yourself an education. It's something nobody can ever take away from you. Recruited as a running back, Ron would find powerful bonds of friendship among teammates and coaches that would propel them to success. We had a great coaching staff and a close relationship with one another. And we went from four and six to an eight and two record in the regular season. We ended up uh, accepting an invitation to the Liberty Bowl. Behind Ron's 154 yards on 15 carries, Utah was victorious in what would be college football's first indoor bowl game but it was in the classroom, inspired by professors that would have the most lasting impact on his life and future in education. My interest in history was reawakened. This is the 60s beginning. The social and cultural history seemed like a, a good course to take. And so Dr. Philip C. Sturgis was the instructor. The grade I received on my midterm was C, C minus, I'm not sure. So I went in to see him in his office during office hours. I told him, man, I'm not a C student. And he looked at it and went through it. Then he tossed it back at me and said, I'm sure, Mr. Coleman, your grades will improve as you learn to apply yourself. Now, I moved from that C minus to a B. Without him, I don't go, ever go into a PhD program. I don't come to the University of Utah. I'm not here. After receiving a bachelor's degree in sociology at the U, Ron returned to California and began teaching history in high school. 
A master's degree soon followed. It was then a former coach encouraged Ron to return to Utah for a PhD. In 1973, Ron joined the University of Utah faculty, teaching courses in history, ethnic studies, and African-American history. I'm very pleased and proud of my education, but I left here with a hole. I had no knowledge of self. And I went out and did what I've been doing the rest of my, uh, most of my life. I read, I found the books, and then having the opportunity and the support from the administrations to include in the curriculum that I was involved with uh, more diverse inclusion. Over the years, Ron has made a deep impact on the lives of thousands of U students and opened the doors to greater understanding of diversity and inclusion. A long list of awards and recognition includes the Calvin S. and Janiel N. Hatch Prize in Teaching, the 2000 Governor's Award in Humanities, and the Albert B. Fritz Civil Rights Worker of the Year Award. Ron is also a lifetime member of the NAACP. I've always had a lot of support in my life journey. It's helped me to become the human being that I've become. I'm pretty damn proud of that. Get yourself an education. It's something nobody can ever take away from you. A good teacher does more than inspire a mind. They can inspire a life. Such is the case in the life of Sidney Dixon. Whether they're famous or infamous, everybody talks about that one teacher who was a person of influence in their lives. Growing up in an idyllic small town, she wasn't sure what she wanted to be. Her grandmother would soon provide an influence that would inspire a life of education for Sidney. A life that has been dedicated to teaching students and helping teachers ever since. I, you know, I did not start out to be an educator. Um, in fact, I wasn't even sure I knew anything about college. I was just a small town kid, living the dream, climbing trees, fishing, and I loved learning. And I would just devour books. My grandmother was my first and most important teacher in a little two-room schoolhouse. It was really, I think, that early start as a student with my grandmother. She was also blessed with caring parents who cared for their family and community that provided a powerful example of service and a love of learning. My parents were very civic-minded. They were high school graduates. They were always really engaged with the community, and my mother especially loved learning. She was always reading, um, involved in a, a lot of organizations in the community, and I think that instilled in me the desire to make a difference. So it didn't take much to light the fire of education in her life. I took an education class and got hooked when a little brown-eyed boy climbed up on my lap and asked me to read him a story. I just really was hooked and I found that it was my calling. My career started as a young teacher right out of college um, when I was 21 years old and I started teaching fourth and sixth grade. While I was teaching, I felt the need to get an advanced degree to help me with counseling, counseling families and students. So that's how I entered into the University of Utah graduate program of school counseling. Sydney's counseling degree began to open doors in school administration, and her drive to help teachers and their students was only magnified. While doing that, I just became so interested in research and um, really thinking about how I could advance the bigger picture of public education, and again, came to the University of Utah for a, a doctoral degree. You know, I've been in education quite a while, and somebody said, have you ever thought of coming to work at the State Office of Education? And I said, no, who would do that? That sounds boring. But it was really about supporting teachers, and I love that work. It was really um, the core of my passion was helping support new and veteran teachers to become their very best. Since 2016, Sydney has been Utah State Superintendent of Public Instruction. And while that was never in her early plans, she has impacted students and teachers across the state. My plan has always been to just make a difference wherever I land. Whatever role I found myself in, it was always about first and foremost developing relationships and then helping people see their potential. 
And just like the grandmother that influenced Sydney's life, her passion is to do the same for each student in this state, no matter their circumstances. That has never been more evident than this past year during the pandemic. Sydney has worked tirelessly to continue to bring education to our state students, whether online, hybrid, or in person, and to deal with the challenge of getting meals to many students who rely on schools for food, putting a lifetime of education and compassion to the test. When all is said and done, I hope that people say that I cared deeply about the success of each individual student. I care deeply that regardless of demographics and background, that every student can come through a Utah school and have a quality experience and be set up for success. I care that every student leaves our system and has opportunities for their future. It's all about working together to help unlock a person's potential and help them see the possibilities for their future. Hal and Joan Wolf began life in the Boston area. They met as teenagers and have been a dynamic duo ever since. Married now for 63 years. I had a friend who lived in the general apartment uh, building uh, that uh, I lived in. He said to me, you know, uh, there's really a cute girl that I know that uh, you might want to take out on a date. And I said, you know, sounds good to me. We got to know each other. It wasn't, you know, um, gun crashing love at first sight. But I knew within six months of meeting him, I was going to marry him, much to the consternation of my aunt, who was my guardian at the time. Joan was just 15. I would kill my kids if they came up with that kind of an announcement. <laughs> Working in a corner drugstore, serving up sodas and ice cream, and eventually helping fill prescriptions, led Hal to a lifelong passion for pharmacology. In 1957, Hal came to the University of Utah, where he received his PhD in pharmacy and then accepted a faculty position at Ohio State. I always enjoyed the ability to help people who had some type of medical issue and they needed some drug or some other thing that could be found to be helpful in a pharmacy. Wherever Hal went, Joan continued her education, earning a BS degree from the University of Utah, an MA in school psychology and PhD from Ohio State University. Returning to Utah in 1975, she was responsible for developing a gifted education program, focusing on working with parents with talented students and students with learning and behavior disorders. To this day, you know, we can go into a grocery store and meet a family and a mother or a dad will say, oh, I want to tell you about Jack, who's now ready to graduate from college. And you saw him when he was 10 years old and we weren't sure we were going to survive. That is hugely satisfying. <laughs> to me, too. <laughs> Hal eventually became Dean of the College of Pharmacy here at the University of Utah. Even with a busy administrative schedule, his joy of teaching never dimmed, especially when it came to helping students understand a new concept. When I was teaching and somebody had asked me a question, and I could write four or five things down and draw a couple of things and some arrows. And I'd turn back and I'd see somebody there looking at that would go, oh. And that was, oh, now I understand. That gave me just a bucket of satisfaction. It was an extraordinarily satisfying working career. Yeah. If I had to do it all over again, I would want to do that. Together, Hal and Joan taught, 
inspired, and guided the education of thousands of University of Utah students. Hal's groundbreaking research in investigational anti-seizure drugs for the treatment of epilepsy continues today. Yet perhaps their greatest joy is creating an endowment that allows them to give back in the form of the Wolf Prize in the College of Pharmacy. Named in honor of Hal's parents, it is indicative of their core beliefs and who they are as people. I think Hal would agree we, have, we believe in, in the tenet in Judaism that is called tikkun olam, of improving the world. So in a very small way, and through a wonderful experience at the University of Utah, we have been um, made an effort to do just that. Beloved by their students, peers, and friends, their contribution to the University of Utah and our community continues to have lasting impact. Not bad for two teenagers from Boston. The University of Utah has provided tremendous amount of collegiality for both Hal and for me, and um, it has been not only our professional milieu, but, our, but also our social milieu. And while it's not the only one, it really has been an important part of our lives. I can only say, absolutely right. <laughs>up in a small rural town in Indiana in the 1950s isn't exactly the time or the place that inspires a young girl to become a scientist. But that was Dr. Ann Osborne Pullman's dream. On her way to that goal, she took a slight detour and became a world-renowned neuroradiologist instead. When I went to Stanford, I majored in uh, psychology with a minor in anthropology was not interested in medical school. And in fact, I was uh, uh, admitted to graduate school PhD program in Harvard. And my research was at Mass General Hospital. And I got more interested in what was going on with the patients than what was going on with the research. And so I uh, decided, you know what? I think instead of getting a PhD in psychology, I ought to be in medical school. So I got it all done, then went to, back to Stanford to go to medical school. Back at Stanford, Anne discovered the world of radiology, particularly neuroradiology. Fascinated with ability of discovery, like a detective, the clues of a brain disorder that would lead to a diagnosis became her passion. Then came an offer from the University of Utah, one she couldn't pass up and has never looked back. When I finished my residency and fellowship, I could have either stayed at Stanford, but I had a job offer at the University of Utah. I wasn't born here, wasn't raised here, didn't go to school here. I did take a look early in my career at other jobs, had a lot of opportunities to go elsewhere, and why go elsewhere? People give their right arms to live here and get jobs here. This is the place. Beyond her teaching and clinical work, Dr. Osborne served as the first female president of the American Society of Neuroradiology. She was the recipient of the Gruby Memorial Award from the Chicago Radiology Society. Dr. Osborne is also the author of definitive medical books and journal articles and is the co-creator of the first comprehensive point of care electronic imaging reference system. And while Dr. Osborne is world renowned in the circles of medicine, her interests extend beyond CT scans and MRIs. She has always been moved and inspired by the arts, becoming a very passionate patron and donor. You know, a life that doesn't include the arts in some way, shape, or form, I think is, is limited. The love for the arts, I think, started when I was uh, very young. And my parents were great believers. They were both college graduates, and they were great believers in having a rounded, liberal arts education. So they would take us to Chicago, we'd go to the museums, we'd go to the Art Institute. I grew to love those things. So arts has always been a part of a part of my life. And I don't have a job in the arts, but actually my heart's in the arts. I visually 
try to do lectures in ways that people get a visual appreciation of the concept that I'm trying to teach. As I'm telling them a story of maybe something like a brain tumor, for example. One of the things that I really appreciated about the U uh, and the arts, uh, not only the performing arts, but the visual arts and so on, is the outreach into the community, bringing arts to kids who may, if they didn't have that, would have grown up without them. Um, I had a scientific mind, but I think I have an artistic heart. Throughout her life, Anne has been an explorer and pioneer. She has traveled the world as a lecturer and thrilled in every country with discoveries of people, food, arts, and the joy of their cultures. She has no plans to slow down or stop learning. I want to keep sharing. I'm still working. I'm still traveling and teaching. There's no selfishness in sharing knowledge with people who really genuinely love what they do. The day you think that you know it all is the day you ought to hang up your spurs and walk and ride into the sunset. Once more, our warmest congratulations to each of you. I hope we are able to celebrate with you in person in the future. For now, I hope those of you watching will reach out to these honorees to offer your own congratulations. My thanks to our University of Utah alumni for putting together this celebration. And as our Giving Day campaign held in conjunction with Founders Day concludes, I want to thank the U community for coming together to imagine more for this university. Giving Day results and more can be found at givingday.utah.edu. And as always, go Utah.